Welcome to another broadcast of the Deborah Ruffini Show on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived. You can find them at artistfirst.com. And now, from England, here she is, your host, Deborah Ruffini. Greetings from England. This is Deborah Ruffini with another edition of the Deborah Ruffini Show. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Ag- Anthony Magnabosco, worldwide promoter and practitioner of street epistemology which is a conversational method for respectfully challenging claims by asking probing questions to uncover the reliability of one's belief formation process. Looking forward to speaking with you, Anthony. Thanks for being on the show. Hi, Deborah. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really nice to be here with you. Oh, that's lovely. How are you doing? I think I'm doing pretty good. A little bit busy. It's still summer. I'm running the kids all over the place as a stay-at-home dad. Oh, yeah. My primary responsibility. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, um, no, everything's going really good, and uh, I'm just very excited to be able to chat with you about street epistemology today. Thank you. Wonderful. It's, it's, yeah, I find it a fascinating subject. And I just, um, for the viewers, I've chosen Anthony because he is, to my mind, and I think many others, the gentle atheist, where sometimes, um, theists don't have, um, a gentle approach, uh, from atheists, just as theists can be a little harsh on atheists. <laughs> Would you agree with that? <laughs> oh, thank you for the characterization. Um, I, I think I do agree. When it comes to these topics, like does a God exist? Yeah. Or uh, other, other sensitive beliefs, we do tend to get pretty irate when we, uh, when we encounter somebody who disagrees with us on those topics. And atheists are just as, capable, I think, of, of being angry and upset and very emotionally charged, I suppose, when mm. we are engaging with somebody who believes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I think there is a different way, and, and you, you can actually have a good, effective conversation with somebody about a sensitive topic yeah. where you bypass a large part of that, those, those outbursts that we might typically see. Oh, that is brilliant. So that... Um so, yeah, so tell us a little bit about your work, what, what you do, and how it originated. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Well, I go out and initiate talks with people because I wanted to get practice using this approach of street epistemology, and I, I assume at some point we'll explain really, really well what that is. But rather than wait for somebody to make a claim, mm-hmm. I initiate a chat with somebody, and I record the conversation. So I ask them to please select a belief that you really think is true. Most people living here in Texas tend to pick supernatural claims. Yeah. For example, they think karma is real or they think a ghost or they perhaps believe in a god. And I set a little timer for five minutes. Usually the conversations last a little, little longer than that. But mm. people tend to enjoy exploring the process that they use to arrive at their levels of certainty that what they think is true is really true. Right. And, yes, so it's, it's just been a really fun, I, I dub it a hobby, but it's such yeah. a fascinating thing yeah. watching people reflect on their belief and, in fact, it seems, express some doubt in the belief that they think is true. Oh, okay. No, that's very interesting. That's And your, your conversations, do they generally tend to be... Um, calm but well, obviously I, I know from your side they're calm <laughs> which is lovely um do you, do you ever get any aggressive kind of you're going to hell sort of judgment upon you it, it kind of depends on the person that i'm speaking with and yeah. my approach that i use so what i found is if i am accusatory and i tell people that they're wrong or try to present evidence that shows that somebody's mistaken you can pretty much that that you will probably get some sort of reaction like that in return. However, mm-hmm. what we're learning is that when you engage in somebody in a respectful dialogue where you're asking questions so that the person that you're speaking with can give you their answers and you listen very intently and pause and move at a nice, slow, respectful speed, mm-hmm. that you don't usually get 
that type of irate response. So if, if these days, if I were to observe that or experience that type of uh, reaction, uh, a negative reaction, it would probably be an indication that I've done something out of line with what street epistemology is. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's very... Yeah, um, that's brilliant. I actually... I do um, feel... For, I mean, I, w- I was brought up in in church. My, my father's a retired minister and sometimes does a bit of lay preaching. Um, but the older I got, the, the more sort of... I've got to be careful because I don't want to run my churches down, but they... It seemed to be the more kind of Pentecostal or fundamentalist church I got involved in. I didn't like the way that atheists were kind of portrayed as, you know, these 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 mean, um, rebellious people that just wanted to do their own naughty thing and, and displease God. And, you know, there was no sort of understanding that this is a sincere disbelief, um, a, a bit like one's sexual orientation it's not something we choose um it's just the, the way it is you know we don't choose what we believe or disbelieve and i've always had i felt quite passionate for atheists because it, it must be i mean as, as a, a mustard seed christian i might add you know that that makes me quite um sad but I, if I, I think if I was an atheist, I would feel very, very upset by that. How, how does that make you feel? There is this perception that atheists really do believe, <laughs> but they want to spin, and they're just saying that they don't believe. And it is frustrating as a non-believer when you hear somebody characterize your position as like that when it really isn't the case. Yeah. There might be some people who have come to atheism that way that they want a certain lifestyle and then they deny God or something like that. But generally speaking, and I talk to a lot of atheists, and but I'm, I'm really speaking for myself here. Mm. I, I don't believe that a God exists simply because there doesn't seem to be a good justification for concluding that that's the case. Right. I wasn't molested as a kid growing up in a Catholic school. Mm. I had a loving family. Um, this, this isn't a choice that I'm making because I, I don't want to live by certain guidelines or something like that. Yeah. This, this it was really an honest exploration of the evidence that is supposedly out there to conclude that this entity is real and seeing time and time again that it falls short. Mm. So on, Now, on the other hand, I can see how religious folks might tend to characterize atheists as being angry and just nasty people that you wouldn't want to be around because, frankly, there are lots of examples where you can see atheists engaging with believers and ridiculing believers, mm. dismissing them outright, teasing them, and sometimes we don't, we're don't we not the best people to be around. You, you, can, you can just see that in our behavior, but mm. it's not coming, I don't think it's coming from a place of us denying the truth. Right. It's more of a place of frustration, I think, when we see people who do still believe this stuff. Yeah. And we wonder, what what are they seeing that we're not? Why yes. do they think that this is this is sufficient evidence when I'm thinking that it's woefully insufficient? So mm-hmm. there is a disconnect. And by engaging with others using a more polite, respectful approach, I think we can bridge that gap. Yeah, I guess so. It's um, just really, it's really interesting to speak to you because I, I can't personally get my head around. Um, and sometimes you've got to think: is this my upbringing, or is this my own personal belief? If you've had an upbringing in in the uh, Christian world, um, I think I'd feel quite scared if I if I didn't believe. I think that I, th- I think you're very brave, and so I'm, I'm talking now as, as if it is your your choice, and I know it's not. <laughs> but um, do you feel? It may sound a strange question. Do do you feel fearful not believing, or is it? Do you feel quite safe believing that we? That it's just a uh, human animal life that's here. Great, that's a great question. So I too was raised in a religious household. Oh, okay, and. 
But even at a young age, I was skeptical and I didn't believe it. It just didn't make sense to me. I literally thought all the parents were pretending as if this was like a Santa Claus claim. Right. And I, when I disclosed that to my parents, they were just horrified and they, they assured me that, no, Anthony, this is really true. Mm. I was always skeptical. Um, right. But it's, I have to tell you, sure, there's a little, there is a little bit of fear every once in a while where I think, hmm, why are all these people believing this stuff? Why do they think that this evidence is sufficient? When I look at it and wonder, this, this is, this is terrible evidence. <laughs> Right. So, so sometimes I, I find myself second guessing myself a little bit. Like, oh man, I, I sure hope I'm right on this because if if I'm wrong, then there's some serious repercussions here. Yeah. But I have to remind myself that as I see it, there's no good reason to think that any of it is true. Right. So when I remind myself of this, it helps me deal with the fear that can often pop up, especially if if, if you've been exposed to these beliefs at a very young age. Yes. It's a very scary thought to think of this idea of hell and eternal punishment and all this other stuff. Yeah. So, so fear is somewhat of a common thing for people who no longer believe. Right. Uh, but there are people too who have they they managed to address it, and the, the the time really to fear something is when we when we've concluded that there's a good reason to do so. I see. Yeah. See, I think. I mean, I. Obviously, you and I obviously had the same um, upbringing, and the whole how thing is is petrifying, isn't it? The, the whole concept. But I, I think sometimes life's experiences sort of bring us to where we are in our our belief system and and what we feel about different things. And I think if if we've got a um, all knowing, all understanding God, He must be able to read into our hearts and understand why we have not been able to believe. Because I think there's lots of people who would love to believe, but they just, they, they don't see, like you're saying, any any evidence. There's just, they you know, they, it's not they want to do their own thing. They just do not see sufficient evidence. And I think it would take quite a mean God to, and sometimes I feel guilty thinking that, that it, w- it would take a mean God to say, well, pff, that's too bad, isn't it? You know, you've, you've had it at the end of the day. And not listen to our hearts. <laughs> um, right. I, I think I agree. I think that if there was an all-knowing God, He would be able to read my mind and tell that I'm being sincere when I say I don't see any good reasons to believe that this is true. Mm. And I also hope that if there is this entity, that it would take into account the the, the behaviors that I engage in, where I, I try to do good things. I don't want to harm people. Yeah. Uh, I want to leave this world in a better place than it is now. So uh, it, it's it's sort of an interesting thing, uh, but I agree, yes, if there if there is this entity, it would know all of those things, and it would mm-hmm. know what it would take to change my mind. So I think it's yes. really important when, you know, I know that this is going out to a largely theistic audience, if you know an atheist, and you're, you're taking it upon yourself to change that person's mind, my advice would be to ask your God to do it, and don't put that pressure on yourself. Ah, well, that's good. That's good, yeah. And there's lots of people, well, I'll be praying for you, Anthony. There's lots of people that will be, <laughs> will be praying for you, which is very sweet. But <laughs> yeah, we know, we, as atheists, we hear that a lot. I bet you I'll do. pray for you, Anthony. I think I will ask God to, to change your heart, to change your mind, or to provide you with the evidence that you need, or... Anthony, he's already provided you with this evidence. Just look around, look at the trees. Yeah. Um, as an atheist who engages with a lot of theists, I've heard a lot of this stuff before. And here's the thing. I, I realize that that advice, that concern is coming from a good place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm no longer an angry atheist, and I can empathize with people who still believe this stuff. And I understand the, mm. the spirit in which those messages are being communicated to me. Okay. Oh, that's lovely. But um, yeah, I, I guess I do. I would just ask yourself to perhaps be willing to investigate the steps to arrive at your claims mm. and see if they hold up to the scrutiny. Yeah, I think um, I think for me it is kind of it goes back. I mean, I'm no uh, you know biologist or, or um, 
I'm not an, an educated person by um, any great standard. But I think for me it comes down to, which you probably heard, oh, you probably heard time and time again, you, I don't want you to yawn at this point, but kind of like the cause and effect and, you know, does it not come down to either you, you have one um, big accident at the beginning followed by a series of further accidents consequently producing order or it starts off with some sort of planner that if we're the um, creation of the planner, we're not likely to understand um, and be able to comment right. much about the planner. Um, so it's it's a difficult one. I mean, yeah. Um, it's, um, yes, we do hear this. We do hear this quite frequently. We do hear this quite frequently where people will say, well, you can't explain how this happened. Therefore, we're justified in asserting that we have the answer. And that answer is this specific God that, by the way, I happen to be raised with. Mm. Um, that, that just strikes me as being disingenuous. I think it's much better to simply say, we don't currently understand how that happened. And let's reserve judgment on assigning an, an explanation to it until we have good reasons to do so. Uh, I could probably point to 30 books that would explain how the universe started. The question is, how can we be sure any of those are actually accurate? And if we don't have a good methodology for concluding that, I think the honest answer is to say, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see. I... I had a, I haven't shared this with many people. You're, you're privileged. I haven't shared. Well, actually, I did share it by email, which was probably better form by email because um, Russell and Tracy were hosting at the time. Um, Tracy read out an email that I sent into the show many years ago, actually, um, and it was about a personal experience that happened to me. And it was I just wanted to take a different sort of approach because so many people at that time, in particular, they were phoning in. The whole thing about, you know, um, God's going to send you to hell. It was the same sort of thing. What what What's made you so angry with God? It was all that sort of thing. So I wanted to take a different approach. And so I thought I would just share something that happened to me as a child. Um, which was to do with what I believe was the supernatural. And Tracy was actually quite right. She, she picked picked up on certain things that I was saying in the email and I used terms like ghost and she was absolutely right. She said, well, how does this woman know it was a ghost? And I thought, well, yeah, it's the best word that I could think of <laughs> to describe. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, I've, I've always, um, been quite skeptical. Even as a kid, there were lots of things that didn't make much sense to me. Um, and there seemed to be a few contradictions. Um, but when I, was at a guess around seven or eight. I think I know I was in infant school. Um, my family used to visit uh, another family. My, uh, my my dad and uh, his friend were kind of um, they'd help each other out with the services and and preach in each other's churches. Um, and the family had they both of their children were the same age as my sister and I, and I was always a bit of a tomboy, and so I was friends with the sun and we'd um, go upstairs and play with action men and, and, you know, pull radios to bits and play with cars and things. <laughs> and we, this particular occasion, we went upstairs, it was in the dark. And there was a lot of witchcraft going on in that area at the time. So this would have been in the late 70s, I'm showing my age, it would have been in the late 70s. His sister's bedroom door was open and there was I'm so glad it's daytime that I'm mentioning this because, because I live alone. <laughs> there was like a glowing figure in the doorway and that's, that wasn't, although that wasn't proof of God, and I, I couldn't comment on that. Tracy was absolutely correct. Um, she, she mentioned things that I wouldn't have thought of. You know, I, I couldn't comment on whether this thing could see us, whether this thing, whatever it was, um, had consciousness, uh, could sense our fear. But I remember my friend seeing this first and just scarpering down the stairs. And I, 
what probably felt like longer than what it was. I, I was just sort of fixated by this and then, you know, followed him as, as quick as my little legs could carry me. And I think, it may sound silly, but I think that is kind of my own personal experience of, evidence rather, for me, that there is something other than just this flesh. Um, and in, in the email, you know, uh, Tracy Harris mentioned that uh, I was a child, uh, we, we have big imagination, uh, what else did she mention? Oh, that um, it, it could have been mistaken, maybe it was a shadow, maybe it was this, maybe it was that. But at the end of the day, it was my experience, and I had a little witness next to me who, way into adulthood, refused point blank <laughs> but you know we lost contact when we were in our 20s and he still would not talk about this incident and I look back at that and I think when I have my doubts and or even health problems um, I've seen something that I believe to be of a supernatural nature uh, right. so what, what do you make so of me when, telling you that? Mm. I'm sorry please no, 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 you, you carry on, Anthony. I just wonder what, what you make of me mentioning this. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that. And, and I've heard this many, many times uh, for a variety of different claims, too. Mm. So it is interesting when I hear it. Uh, what I think is important when we, when we hear something like that is to acknowledge that you probably experienced something. Yeah. There, I do see a tendency, especially amongst skeptical people, to dismiss what you're saying. Oh. So... I'm willing to get on board with something happened. You, you've observed something or something occurred. The question is, how can we determine that it was a, was a ghost and you're actually defining it as something? Right. As opposed to saying, now I observed this thing. It was shaped like this. I'm not quite sure what it was. Has anyone seen anything similar? Mm. How could we actually test this uh, is there some way that other people can observe it and experience it? Now, what's interesting about your story is that somebody else apparently experienced it, mm. although it would be interesting to actually find out what that individual would describe happened at that point. Yeah. Um, he wouldn't. It, it, there's also a temptation, I think, from skeptical people, and it sounds like maybe Tracy even did this, is to provide explanations, potential explanations of what you experienced. Oh, have you checked for gas leaks? Maybe your older brother, the older brother of the family, was playing a trick on people. Mm. Father was doing a prank or something like that. Maybe it was the the sun glinting off of the china that was in the cabinet across the way. My recommendation is to simply ask the person how they conceive that it, they think that it is. Why aren't you taking the extra step and saying this is something that I that I don't know what it was? And then giving it an explanation, defining it even. I'm not sure why that jump is being made. If somebody in Ireland were to experience something similar, what they call it a leprechaun. If this was, if this was something happening in, uh, I don't know, um, New Mexico, would they, would they dub it an alien? I'm always interested in the, the noun that people choose to describe the things that they have difficulty explaining how it happened. Yeah. See, for me, um, although I, could, I can't comment on was this someone that had previously been alive in bodily form, was it a devil, was it an angel, was it um, whatever, it, it still comes down for me that there was a lot of witchcraft going on in the area and in the house next door, um, it was a practising occultist. Um I, I can't see, seem to get... What, what, what I think would be interesting is whether or not we can reproduce the event. Could this event be reproduced so that other people can see it? Is it possible to record it on video? Uh, how can we actually test this to see if it is what we think that it is? Yeah. When, when we don't have that backing, I think the time certain that this is really what you think that it is, uh, is, is not, we're not quite there yet. Uh, on, the, on the other, you know, I, I, with that being said, I recognize that you had this experience. I didn't. If I had had this experience, I might be in your shoes, especially. Yeah, I'm not sure. 
Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you. You're, you're cutting out there a little bit. Um, are you still with us? Yes. Oh, good. Oh, you're, you're clear now. Sorry, sorry. Could you say that last bit again, please, sir? I forget what I said. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. I think it was something along the lines of... Yeah. I could very easily be in your shoes and have had that experience, and I could be scratching my head why other people don't take me seriously for saying for explaining what I think I saw. Right. But I think the, the best way to the best way to really overcome that type of skepticism that a lot of people have, I think, would be to back it up with some sort of evidence. It's difficult, isn't it? Because we could go you and I could both go into that house now and say, right, come on, where are you? But we can't explain why this may not happen when we go back. Um, so in right. that respect, it's kind of right. difficult right. to test it. Um, maybe this technically maybe this only appears to young children who are alone or something like that. Like, I think this would be a very, very difficult thing to test. Yeah. It, yeah, it is, isn't it? Because it seems to... Um, yeah, it, it seems to be coming down to different people's experience. So what do you feel about numerous accounts of similar things, actually, which could bring us on to things like near-death experiences that, that people that have had um, an experience of, a, they've all been of a, a, a very similar nature. Um, right, right. Again, yeah, you hear these stories of people, they, they actually, I guess, physically die, that, that could be confirmed to some degree, and then they will be revived and then report some sort of experience. And then they and others around them might conclude that they were actually living in some other universe or something, or they, they've crossed over to the other side. Mm. I think we have to be very careful in how much we give traumatized brains in believing what they're reporting. It's conceivable that nothing at all happened during that time, and mm. yet the brain is struggling to account for that missing duration of time. And it's constructing some sort of explanation based on the imagination of the person who just was was not breathing for ten minutes or something like that. It, it, it's you know I I just don't I don't really I, I, this isn't really an area that I've studied, and uh, yeah. I guess being a skeptic, I think I would just be a little bit less apt to just believe what a person is telling me, especially if they are on drugs and they've been traumatized. And they've been oxygen deprived for a number of minutes. Mm. Would it not tend to be more? Um, I mean, I, I haven't had the experience at all. Um, would it not tend to be more like dreamlike state rather than the people that have had these experiences tend to say that they quite often their lives have been changed, and and they believe that they've actually left their bodies. It hasn't been a dream. Um, right. And the yeah, it's funny. I, I, I heard the I, I heard an account of a woman who was an atheist, and she was really into science fiction. Oh, right. And she had experienced uh, some sort of trauma. And after she after they revived her, she was recounting how she was aboard a starship and really? <laughs> engaging with the mm-hmm. engaging with these characters. So it, it certainly makes me wonder. Is, is the brain simply trying its best to explain what's happening and choosing the best narrative, the most popular or comforting narrative that that person has lived with to help explain this perhaps traumatizing event? I, I really don't know. I, I'm not like said, it's not an area that I'm very well versed in, but it is something that's interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's, in a sense, it's, um, it's a comforting thing, but it's, it's also... Some experiences aren't aren't as as pleasant, from what I understand. But it's kind of interesting that when they see people, um, it's it usually seems to pe- be people that have died. <laughs> um, see, there again, it's it's not it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's not um, for me, it's not proof, but it's kind of uh, know, evidence or or kind of indication. Um, 
Yeah, it is a difficult one because um, unless we've actually yeah, and then of course no person yeah. has um, died right. for like two years and then come back. And <laughs> it's you know it's the, the, the time mm, frame as well. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I don't think we have any instances of somebody being dead for a significant period of time. I'm thinking anything probably longer than in 30 minutes maybe might be the, the longest. I'm thinking perhaps of like a, a hypothermia victim or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah I, again, this is one of those areas where I think we just have to be careful in, just like where, does, where did the universe come from? Sometimes the best answer is to, to say, this is a great question and we need to investigate this as best we can using the best tools that, that are available to us. Mm. And resist the temptation to offer uh, an explanation, and or, or let's say even a certain explanation, until we have some sort of method, reliable method, to justify arriving at that conclusion. Do you think if there was a god, there would be a scientific method to prove him? That's a good question. Most people think that an entity, a god, is supernatural, and that, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. How can we detect a supernatural entity in this natural world? Mm. Would it cease to become a supernatural act if we could actually detect it? Now, there are a lot of people who will pray to this higher power. Mm. I would imagine they're not doing so because they think there's absolutely no chance that the God would hear it and intervene and change things. So I suppose perhaps doing a study on the universe, a universe that we would not survive in, mm. but it's perfectly fitted to them because they are a product of it. And seeing them look and marvel at how perfectly designed it is for them, and it just must be some sort of justification, a perfect justification for why they should be certain that their God is real. Yeah. Have you ever heard of the Douglas Adams puddle? No, no. Oh, Fill me in. I think I'm yeah. quoting this. Um, he says that, imagine, imagine for a moment you're a puddle and you can wake up and you look around and you just marvel at how perfectly designed this hole that you're, res that you're residing in was made just for you. Mm. And even as as the water kind of starts getting evaporated and so forth, you just marvel at how still you perfectly fit inside this depression in the mud. And I think that's a lot, that's a, that's a great metaphor for what I think is happening for humans. Yeah, Look sure. Look around and we, we, we seem to see design and it's just perfect for us. Until you start to realize how, how, how few areas we could actually survive in if you really take into account uh, we, we have just a, just a very limited little ecosystem that I think humans can survive in. Yeah, yeah, and I guess... Do you think Darwin changed a lot of things when he... I know Richard Dawkins has said... Um, uh, oh, crumbs. He, he said, worse to the effect of people could sort of be f forgiven for believing um, in a supernatural being pre-Darwin but um, regarding the origins of the actual universe, we're still, in a sense, waiting for our Darwin um, to come about. Mm. Uh, so that's kind I of interesting. Pretty, I, I'm not familiar with his quote, but that sounds like a pretty good characterization. I think it's fairly clear that with all the evidence that supports Darwin's hypothesis, evolution is a fact. Humans did evolve. Mm. Now, where we're stuck right now and we're using the tools of science to try to figure out this wonderful question, is where did life come from? How could life potentially come from non-life? And it seems like it seems like we're making progress, and I'm so hopeful in our lifetimes, Deborah, that we figure out the answer to that. Uh, but I don't think we're there quite yet. No, no. Now, I don't... This is where I'm quite... Do you know, I don't actually remember being taught evolu evolution in school. I either wasn't paying attention because I was too thick for science. <laughs> or I wasn't... I find it hard to believe I wasn't taught evolution. I must have... Maybe I was off that week. Um, I don't know much about evolution. Um, I've been to certain uh, 
sort of creationism seminars and I've been to, we've got a, um, in my town, we've got a creationist museum and, uh, it's, uh, I understand there's, there's one in, in your neck of the woods. <laughs> it's a big well, one. I think there's one in, there's one in Kentucky, which is uh, pretty far from where I'm at here in Texas. But yes, what's interesting yeah. is that, uh, there's a pretty sizable contingent of people that think that the Bible is literal and, and this God created humans in their present form and, and the earth has only been here for 6,000 years and there is this worldwide flood. All of the science that, that is, that is, that we're, that we're, that we're, uh, <laughs> all the science that we're using to unearth these answers completely contradicts with what uh, the biblical narrative is. Uh, it, I find it sad that, uh, that so many people are adhering to it. I understand that there are a lot of people that think, well, if it says it in my book, it must be true. Damn the science. But it's such a dangerous, uh, position to take, I think. I mean, Science seems like it's the best way that we can determine what's really happening in this reality. Yeah. What do um, atheists make? And again, I don't. This is only what I've was was taught when I was making my notes. That this was a long, long time ago. The the creationist seminar. Um, they said they found no transitional forms in the fossil record. Is that is that true? Do you know? You've heard atheists say this. Oh, sorry. Um, no, <laughs> no. Um, creationists, yeah. Oh, creationists. Mm. Yes, uh, that's it's very common uh, when you are engaging with a creationist who thinks that the Earth is very young. And sure, there might be something called macro. Let me think here. Is it microevolution? I'll get confused between know, the two. Yeah. I think they they think that there's microevolution, like there are small changes in animals, but uh, macroevolution is just not true. Mm. And then. What we tend to do as atheists is point people to evidence that shows that they're mistaken. So these days, especially when I'm using street epistemology, and in fact, I, I literally had a conversation with a person. Uh, he was a science teacher too, which was really baffling, but he thought that the earth was young. Yeah. And I asked him, what would change your mind that evolution was really true? And he said a transitional fossil showing an animal that was migrating out of the oceans onto land. Okay. But before I pointed him to that evidence, I wanted to make sure that that really would change his mind. And when he agreed that it would, that's when I pointed him to Walt Kallick was the example that I pointed him to. Uh, sometimes we po- we sometimes we throw a lot of evidence at people when not basing their belief on evidence at all. I think he was a rare exception where he was able to identify what would change his mind and agree that it actually would. Mm. So, typically what we find is when we're engaging in these talks using street epistemology is that people are not basing these supernatural beliefs on evidence. They're basing it on something else. Usually, I was raised that way. I get a sense of comfort from thinking that it's true. I'm using faith to conclude that this belief is true, something like that. Right. And uh, and that's that's what's so fun about having these engagements is getting down to the foundation of what's propping up this belief, and it's almost never evidence. Mm. Can you think of anything that would convince you that there was a god? Mm. Can you think of some something that? I, I often think. Mm. I often think about that. Yeah. My my pat answer is something along the lines of. If a god existed, it would know what I would require to change my mind. Ah, yeah. But I, I try to think of my my confidence that my belief is true on a scale. Yeah. So, right now, if you were to ask me how confident I was that a god existed on a scale from zero to 100, which is something that I often ask people to do when I'm engaging with them, using SD, I would probably put myself very low on that scale, maybe at, at 2%. But I, I can move. I'm, I'm certainly willing and able to move to a 98, a 99. I don't, and I can give you a specific example if you want that. I don't know if I could say I could identify something that would move you to a 100. I think I'm, I would still be skeptical. Even if all the stars aligned in the sky and they spelled out, Anthony, I am your Lord and Savior, 
and other people around me could see it. Yeah. How would I know it wasn't some sort of advanced alien species that was able to do that or some very complicated government trick or something along those lines? Yeah. Or maybe I, I was actually having like a loser. So, but I think when it comes down to it, I think this God would know what it would take to bring me to to 100% certainty where there would be no doubt in my mind that he was real. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It, yeah, we could always put it down to something else, couldn't we? I mean, quite often I um, uh, I used to have reoccurring dreams and they I was going through a bit of a um, rough patch with a, with a relationship and I, I sorry felt... Like, sorry, Anthony. Oh, I just said I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, that's okay. Oh, no, it's all over now. It's brilliant. <laughs> Single life is great. <laughs> but it was very odd because, yeah, I came to... Uh, sorry. So it got to the point where um, it was quite an abusive relationship and I I um, felt on the point of going a bit mad. And a lot of the time I would have kind of panicky episodes wondering if everything was real and sort of questioning my own sanity. And I seem to have a recurring dream. It would be whenever I would go up to see this person, I'd be so nervous because I knew it was going to be awful. And sometimes we do ridiculous things knowing we're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> but I would always have this beautiful dream before I went. And I used to think, surely that's God at work. Or it could have just been something that we don't know about that... Where, where the brain just knows that that's what I've got to have before I go up to see this awful person. Um, but that that always intrigued me. What knows that I need to dream that dream to give me strength to do this journey? That's a great question. <laughs> and I meet a lot of people who will say, there's no way I could have gotten through that difficult time uh. without my entity, without my God. And Sometimes just having a talk about how they think other people who don't believe in any higher power gets through a difficult time. And most people tend to know somebody like that. They, they, they have a sister or a friend who, or coworker who doesn't believe in God and, and was able to get through a difficult time. Mm. And I think it kind of cheapens. I, I understand why people might do that. They might think, oh, there's no way I'm capable of getting through this difficult divorce or I just lost my job and my kids are hungry, but I managed to get through it and it was because of my God. Mm. Was it really? Yeah. Or did you do something or did others step forward to help you and you're misremembering it or you're lowering your own self-worth because you don't think you're worthy of thinking that you're capable of getting through difficult times and you're putting it on some entity that doesn't even exist. It's, it's, it saddens me sometimes when I hear people who they tend to, like I said, they tend to lower themselves and not give themselves credit for the things that they've actually done mm. to get through those hard times. All right, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. How do you feel about... See, this is this is where I think atheists are very, very brave. To me, the, the thought of um, this physical body dying and just being in, in eternal non-existence absolutely petrifies me. Just the thought of nothingness forever and ever. Does that... How how do you live with that? Because I think that would drive me insane. Hmm. Well, the common retort to that is something along the lines of, how stressed are you about not existing before you were born? <laughs> yeah. and, if the, and if the answer is, well, I had no recollection of it, well, that's kind of where we're at right now. So, interestingly, these days, there are lots of things that we can do to have ourselves go on. Right. Aside from the people remembering us, pictures are taken. We're recording our voices right now and broadcasting this out. This will probably be out there for millennia. Mm. Uh, so, in a way, our thoughts, who we are, will we'll survive our death. And that's a really fascinating Thing. And I think that there are things that we can do today to make the world a better place in how we raise our kids and how we act around other people, the laws that we enact. 
that even though, yes, we probably die and that's it, mm. it doesn't cheapen this life. It doesn't make this life less important. And I don't really spend a lot of time fearing what life would be like without me being here. I do mm. have a little bit of concern for the loved ones in my life. For example, my wife and kids. Yeah. I can think of how hard it would be for me not to be around. And that saddens me. But my my ceasing to exist doesn't, frankly, bother me all that much. Doesn't it really? My goodness, I wish I had your faith <laughs> in that. <laughs> my goodness. See, that's this is going to make me sound really selfish because my last thought is... Well, not my last thought. That, that's going to make me sound very selfish. Um, my first thought, should I say, would be... <gasps> I'm never going to know existence. I'm never, ever. It's not going to be just for five years or 5,000 years. It's going to be forever, never, ever knowing existence again. And at one point, that oblivion had to stop for me in 1971 when I was born. You know, but it's, so what about, um, without being a scientist as, I, as I'm not, people that say, yeah, but energy can't, once, you, once we're energy, we can't ever be destroyed. That keeps that keeps going on, and that is our consciousness. Is is there anything valid in that, do you think? Well, I think you could say that the nutrients that are in my body and the chemicals that are in my body will be transferred into other things. Like, right, like when I die, my body will break down. Mm. There will still be those chemicals. But, but who I am or the essence of who I am, or a, I don't think that I have a soul that goes on. I think when Anthony Magnavosco dies, that's it. Mm. But the the atoms that are in my body will be naturally repurposed elsewhere. So uh, I guess technically who I am uh, does go on, but in a, in a more of a naturalistic type of way rather than some sort of supernatural thing. Wow. That's, yeah. That's, I think that's brilliant. I think that must be... Um quite a peaceful life to not have fear of that and and like you say your, your main fear would be thinking about your loved ones um but yeah, like the, the, the idea that we might discover alien life on another planet after i'm dead does sadden me because these mm -hmm. are answers that i would love to be able to to enjoy now yeah uh, that, but that being said i'm comfortable by saying i don't know or we don't know yet it's, it's an uncomfortable thought, but I'm okay with uncertainty. I, I'm, I'm okay with that, and I'm okay with the idea that this life is probably all that we have. But I do think it makes this one life that I think that we all have more valuable to me. Mm. It makes me want to spend my time more efficiently, like having conversations with you that might reach a new audience, or uploading a video of a conversation where somebody seriously challenged the, their God belief because I was asking questions using street epistemology, mm. uh, hanging out with my kids, or taking the dog for a walk. Yeah. These, these are all wonderful things that, that I, I enjoy doing. And I think in a way, if I felt like there was some sort of better alternative than what's going on now, that it would, it would greatly cheapen this one life that I think that I have. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. That's interesting, because I think if I believed I was going to be wormy at the end of the day, I'd just be looking at my watch all the time. <laughs> I'd just be counting down. <laughs> but counting down for the next life, you mean? Uh, no, if, if I believed this was the only life I had, I'd just be thinking, oh no, how many more? Oh, uh, no. How many no, more on the contrary. I think, I think if I thought that, that this was just a, a, a pass-through point until something greater, I'd be looking at my watch wondering... When am I heading to that, that better life? Yeah. Uh, no, this, I, I love reality and I, I love the, the finite, uh, seemingly finite existence that I have. Um, it's mm -hmm. funny, you know, when, when you come to grips with that, it takes a lot of the pressure off. I, I, don't, I don't think it's, a, it's an alarming thought. It tends mm -hmm. to be somewhat of a liberating one. Yeah, I could, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's there's a saying that there's nothing to fear except fear itself, and I guess that you can sort of incorporate that in it, really. Um, 
It's just yeah, it's it's the fear of the end. But like you say, you you don't, you wouldn't know, would you? You it would just be nothing, and you can't experience nothing. <laughs> so I guess it's um. Right. Right. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think it would be wonderful to if we could figure out a way to extend human life, and I, I could I could choose to live five hundred years or a thousand years. Mm. It's conceivable that if I'm able to stay alive in the next for the next twenty years. The science might improve to the point where it could extend my life 50. And if I can make that cut, I might be able to survive 500 years. And if I could survive that cut, mm. you know, maybe we really are on the threshold of, of having the option to live for pretty much as long as we want. But yeah, I, I think about it. I mean, would you really want to live forever? <laughs> it's, well, it's... I don't know if I would. It depends what forever is. I mean, I've got a lovely picture on my... Sorry, I'm looking at it. In the, sorry, you can't see it. It's... Um, there's a photographer who takes all these um, sort of sun, beautiful sunset pictures. And I look at that. And sometimes when I'm a little bit low, I think, oh, wouldn't it be lovely if you just pass away? And that's just the next chapter. You just go into that. And I think, yeah, I could do a few million years just there. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> maybe in a different a different picture <laughs> and um yeah, yeah a million, I mean, million I years a million years might be fun but let's think about eternity where yeah. we're talking billions of billions of billions of years mm, i mean i thanks. think at some point a person would think uh yeah i, I think i've had enough <laughs> 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 take me out of this take me out of this loop <laughs> Unless it just keeps going where we sort of have death for a while and then we come alive again. That would be ideal. So we could sort of just have like breaks. We can have a break from eternal life now and then. <laughs> That'd be good. I'd quite like that. Do you know, I, I had a chat with a friend the other day and she said something really quite freaky to me. She said, for all we know, this could actually be death. And when we actually die, that's when we live. Oh, don't, don't. That's too deep. I can't go there. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's some interesting theories out there. Yeah, but it's it is good that we don't. I think we would actually lose our marbles if we if we knew everything. It would make our head explode, and I think it's a good thing that we don't know. We can't be absolute. Whatever our belief system is, I, I think it's it's a good thing that we don't absolutely know for certain. I think it keeps our minds stable, as stable as one mind could be. Um, it does seem like humans have evolved with this desire to to understand and to explore, uh, despite the fear and the cost that can come with that. Mm -hmm. uh, that might be one of those things that just makes us human. There might be other sentient beings that have evolved to the point where, uh, along the lines where they don't have that, that desire to explore and to question things. That might be one mm -hmm. of those things that just makes humanity unique. Then again, there might be other sentient beings out there where that's common. It's part of the evolutionary process where you try to understand your surroundings and improve your lot in life and reduce harm and improve well-being. It just might be something that that creatures um, are are evolving with. Yeah, yeah, that's oh, that's, that's true. Fascinating stuff. Very exciting stuff. Oh, well, Anthony, it's been great to have you on the show. It's been lovely to talk to you. And, and um, you know, I really do want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your kindness and gentleness. And I, th I think theists feel a lot more at ease speaking to someone like you, knowing that we're not going to be called stupid or balmy or, you know, it's it's and it's just a, a beautiful conversation, exchanging ideas and beliefs, and it, it's wonderful. And I, you know, I, I was going to say no, I do. I, I, I thank God for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for inviting me on your, on your show and, and your kind words. And oh, I, I do think that I know we didn't spend a lot of time on street epistemology, but I, I hope your audience looks into it because it seems yeah. it, it was born out of the atheist community, but it doesn't need to be limited to that. I'm hoping that people, all sorts of people, everybody uh, looks into this method and tries to learn it because it does seem to be changing the uh, the, the overall <laughs> scene of atheism in a way. That, that might be an overstatement, I'm not sure. But there are a lot of people who don't believe, who are tired of having frustrating, non-productive, 
disruptive conversations with believers. I think this is a better way, and it seems to be changing the atheist community for the better. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. I like that. Uh, yeah, I, I I think that's beautiful. And so we'll we'll have. Is it okay to have your um, you have a, is it a website or your Facebook for street epistemology? You have a website. We do have a website. Yeah. We do have a website. It's streetepistemology.com. Right. We also have a playlist of videos. The best way to learn more about street epistemology, in my view, is to watch examples. So you can go to yeah. my YouTube channel, which is Magna Bosco two one zero. Right. YouTube forward slash Magna Bosco two one zero, and there's also a playlist on my channel. You have to scroll down a little bit where you can see content from other people who are engaging with God believers and people who make claims that there is no God and people who make claims about karma being real or that ghosts exist mm. and we engage with them using this Socratic questioning. And I think you'd be really fascinated by it. That's brilliant. Yeah, we'll have those, um, <clears throat> excuse me, those, those links on the homepage if that's okay. And yeah, for the viewers, um, I was very impressed with um, your talk on a turning point for atheism. That was very good. So we'll have that link if that's okay. Um, oh, wonderful. That would be great. That's, that was very good. I enjoyed that. And uh, well, thanks again, Anthony. Really appreciate that. And uh, to the listeners, uh, much love as always. Big blessings. And till next time. See you then. Bye.